Hi everyone, um, thank you for inviting me here to speak with you today. I'm honoured to share some thoughts and track the journey of a fabulous new distance sculpture gracing the walls at Nether Troy. Um, this is one of the outcomes of the Rediscovering the Antonine Wall project and it has created several replicas based on original Roman distance sculptures from the Antonine Wall here in Scotland. But first, I thought it may be quite useful to provide some geographical, chronological and some cultural context into which these unique monuments sit. As the name suggests, these are a collection of sculptures that have been recovered from along the Antonine Wall, and that is the Roman Empire's most northwesterly frontier. Now, this was a massive monument that cleaved a route through the central belt of Scotland right across the Clyde Forth Isthmus. Now along the wall there were 17 forts constructed as we can see here um, and interspersed between those forts were a series of smaller fortlets and watchtowers. So to put the wall into its wider geographical and its strategic importance um, it's highlighted here at the top left of your screen is one segment um, of part of a protected UNESCO World Heritage Site entitled Frontiers of the Roman Empire, which stretches across several countries. Now, the region that we currently know as Scotland saw several incursions from the Roman army, um, dating all the way from the first through to the fourth century CE. Now, the period that we, of course, are particularly interested in is this of early to middle second century when the Emperor Antoninus Pius commissioned the construction of this mural barrier around 142. And to give you an idea of how the forts I mentioned a moment ago along the wall um, looked, um, this is Rough Castle. It's in fact uh, in Falkirk and it's pretty much the best preserved fort along the wall. We can see the outline of the fort here. And then there's some annex buildings um, or uh, some annexes over to the side here. So it's a kind of complex, if you like, um, of different features sitting along the wall. You can just about make out on the top there. This aerial shot hopefully provides a wider geographical perspective and setting of Roth Castle Fort, which is just down on the left now here, uh, in its setting with the remains of the Antonine Wall. So what we have effectively is on the south, we have the Roman controlled area. And to the north, we have uh, as the Romans would have called them, wild barbarian northerners um, who would have been potentially quite hostile to that incoming um, Roman military force. And then down the centre, we have the Antonine Wall remains. Um, and we'll go over that in a bit more detail in a moment. But after a long period when knowledge of the wall had actually fallen completely out of memory, um, its antiquarian rediscovery prompted the General William Roy to record its surviving features and remains uh, of forts in great detail in his military map of Scotland dating to 1793. And so what this does is it gives us a really fantastic overview of plans of all the surviving fort remains along the wall. And you can see that all of them are actually quite different in character but they do survive well up until that point. And it's a very useful historic document and resource um, and record really of these standing remains in the late 18th century. On the bottom, we even have some really interesting profiles uh, of the wall. That is a sideways view, if you like, of the terrain into which the forts sat. There's long been interest in the Antonine Wall uh, since the uh, antiquarian times and in fact the Glasgow Archaeological Society in particular um, was very prolific in undertaking investigations and um, excavations along it and helping it really to augment our understanding of the wall and the features along it as well as the installations along it. 
So maintaining that rough castle fort connection we had a moment ago, here we have members of the Glasgow Historical Society at Rough Castle Fort dating to the 19th century. And the astute amongst you might notice that actually on the left here we have uh, a woman, which is quite an unusual event um, of the day to see women involved in these activities. And we also have a couple of children um, in this photograph as well, which is great to see some young people, even in those days, being interested in their heritage. So the Antonine Wall differs very markedly from its predecessor and neighbour to the south that um, doubtless many of you are very familiar with, Hadrian's Wall. And unlike Hadrian's Wall, the Antonine Wall was not constructed of stone, uh, but in fact it was constructed of large turf slabs that were laid atop of each other. Um, and that stretched to somewhere between three to four metres high, and that's roughly a minimum of 20 turves deep. And we can just see that in profile here in this section of the wall that's been cut through. And all of these kind of squared off rectangular features that we see uh, gives us a really clear uh, and interesting understanding of the stratigraphy of the layers uh, upon which all of these turves sat and constructed the wall. But actually, we speak a lot about the wall. Um, in fact, the wall was only one feature of an infrastructure of connected elements. Uh, and these elements include the turf rampart, which we see here in Remain, which is the wall itself. Um, and as I mentioned, that stood to a height of between three and four metres. And that was inclusive of a, of a stone base. We'll talk a bit about that a little bit more in a moment. Um, so immediately to the north of that, we have the berm, which is a platform that separated the wall from the deep ditch. It was a deep five metre V-cut ditch, which is often referred to as a, an ankle breaker. And we can see why that is potentially um, the nomenclature for this very Roman characteristic ditch, which is a very, very sharp incline with a ending in a very sharp V at the bottom, as I say, very characteristic of um, Roman ditches. Immediately to the north of that ditch, you'll see the upcast mound, and that was constructed of the spoil from the ditch. But one feature that is very rarely discussed, but should really be considered an equally essential part of that infrastructure, is the military way. And that sits on the south of the wall uh, or in the Roman controlled part of the frontier. A little bit more of that later. Um, but taken together, all of these features really created a sequence of defensive elements against which any incursions from these northern barbarians, as Roman writers would have been termed these local, local hostile people, um, so I guess we could say it's a bit like a modern day Ironman um, obstacle course, if you like, that some people actually now do for fun. Um, not me, but uh, I know colleagues um, who actually spend their weekends doing this. And I just wanted to show you how this type of activity really demonstrates what it might have been like um, trying to navigate and um, you know, get over that really muddy feature of a wall um, back in the day, which would not have been a pleasant experience. Um, and you would have had a lot of obstacles to overcome to get to that point. And here, just to give you maybe a better understanding of, of, of the construction phases of, of the wall, we can see the illustration here of the ditch being cut. The legions are you know, discussing the best way to um, undertake their activities just to the north of that. At the berm, we can see these um, oblong shaped um, holes in the ground there, Lilia, which are effectively another set of obstacles. They would have had these really sharp, um, sharpened uh, wooden sticks pointing out of them, probably covered by bracken or other such um, uh, bush type uh, material to hide them. And they would have had, uh, as I say, spikes 
um, embedded into them to, to create a, a very dangerous obstacle for any hostile um, northerners to try to navigate as they reach the wall, which itself may have had similar types of stakes protruding from it. Uh, on the top, we potentially have a walkway, certainly where the forts were located with some bastion up there. Um, and on the right, we can see a reconstruction of a gateway that would have been placed where the openings along the wall uh, would have allowed the movement of people back and forth from the north into the south again. And just to give you even a better idea of how that wall base was constructed, here are the foundations at Bears Den Fort uh, near Kilpatrick. And as I say, they give us a really interesting understanding um, and context for that very wide, four metre wide stone base that was required for that heavy turf wall to sit atop. We can even see that central ditch, um, a drainage ditch running through that there. And again, that, that drainage ditch coming up on the bottom of the screen, just to give you that overview of of the, 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 the structure that would have been at the base to hold the, the very heavy rampart on top. So getting back to our main topic of discussion today, the distance sculptures. Here is a map of their fine spots in the vicinity of the wall. Um, you'll see that many of them have been recovered from the western sector of the wall. And we'll discuss um, where the, dis the distance sculpture we're talking about today comes from in just a moment. So I thought it'd be very useful to give you an idea of some of the distance sculptures um, that we have. And this is the Bridge Nest sculpture. It's perhaps the, well, the best known example of distance sculptures. Um, it's now located in the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. And it's a really beautifully preserved example of um, of these unique monuments. And what it does is, it, I think it demonstrates really nicely that, that a familiar format that we have for them. Here we have a central inscription panel um, is flanked on either side by some really beautifully articulated iconography. Sometimes we also have these pelta on the side, which are shield-like shapes that frame on either side these types of central um, inscription panels, which are, as we see here, quite often uh, framed with double ribbed or single ribbed um, frames. But actually, I wanted to draw your attention to the inscriptions themselves, even those of you who are potentially familiar with Latin may not necessarily immediately recognise the text here as Latin. And that's because what we have is a very formulaic, abbreviated format of Latin um, that is very common to Roman inscriptions of the day. And from the Bridge Nest sculpture, we can see the, the pattern of the abbreviated words um, that are common to all of our distance sculptures, um, along with the, the, the English translation. So just to very briefly state the Latin um, abbreviated is imp says Tito Elio Hedre Antonino Og Pio P P Lige to Og Per and then MP lots of Roman numerals <laughs> in fake. And that translates to for the Emperor Caesar Titus Aelius Hadrianus Antoninus Augustus Pius to give the Emperor his full title. Father of his country, the second Augustan legion built this over a distance of 4,652 units of measure. So these sculptures actually served several purposes. They are dedications to the Emperor, showing legionary loyalty primarily. But they also document the legions who were here building the frontier, and that is, as we know, the 2nd, the 6th and the 20th. And we know this because we have these inscriptions. They also tell us with that number at the bottom, um, which differs on different um, distance sculptures. So they tell us the length of the frontier that each of these legions were building, hence their nomenclature. But they also, in fact, provide 
some really graphic scenes of life on the frontier. So we have things like on the on the right, we can see a religious scene. Um, in actual fact, what we're seeing is the, the legions undertaking um, a sacrificial ceremony. Um, we also have other examples of um, deities, Roman deities, and also some military activities. So on the left, for example, we see quite a familiar scene from Roman frontier sculptures, which is uh, a scene of battle. Here we have a Roman cavalryman who is riding down and in fact decapitating naked northern warriors in the heat of a, of a very vicious battle. Now, another example of this type of sculpture, another distance sculpture, is the Roman, uh, is the Somerson Farm uh, piece on the bottom right here. But actually, we have a similar format. And in fact, you'll notice that on the, on the left of the Somerson Farm, rather than that mid battle scene on the bridge nest above, we have here now a post battle scene where we have um, the northern warriors are now no longer in the heat of battle. They are now captives. We can see their arms are bound behind them. They're still naked. Their swords are scattered on the floor around them. Their shields are scattered around them. And the cavalryman is effectively guarding them um, whilst receiving honours from the goddess victory, probably because of the celebration of uh, his victory over over these local warriors. But actually also these distant sculptures served as a form of propaganda insofar as they're demonstrating very visibly and visually the, the might and power and strength of Rome. And, and that's to various audiences, including Roman soldiers, um, communities who were followers of the Romans um, in, in local vicus, what we call um, sort of small villages attached to some of the ports, um, but also to strike fear into local peoples who would have also engaged with them. So these are really very powerful and iconic objects that are actually unique uh, across all of the frontiers of the, the Roman Empire. Now it might surprise you to know that none of these objects were found in their original context on the wall. Um, many in fact were found in the immediate vicinity south of the Muro barrier. But others, in fact, were built into boundary walls or gateways of nearby stately homes. Um, one even made its way all the way north to Concardenshire, where it was embedded into the Great Hall of Dunalter Castle by the Earl's Marshal. And that is a really enigmatic setting uh, just off the northeast coast of Scotland. But that's a whole other story and we don't have time to cover it today. But conventional wisdom has always been adamant that the distance sculptures record the measurements of the wall, that is the ramparts construction. But you'll remember I mentioned earlier that the infrastructure of the wall um, included the military way. Now, the military way is a critical feature of the frontier um, because it was used to transport troops and supplies along. And I'm quite sure local people may also have used um, this roadway to navigate the area as well. Why wouldn't they? Um, but I'm also going to suggest quite controversially, I would say that um, since only in fact two of the distance sculpture make very explicit mention of the walls construction. In fact, I'm going to suggest the distance sculpture might more logically have been placed along the military way. Uh, a bit like road markers that we're very accustomed to seeing today, in fact. Um, and I think if I can show you this next image, I stole this from a presentation uh, made by Dutch scholars uh, on a completely different topic recently. But I think it really demonstrates my point very nicely. If we can imagine these um, Roman soldiers walking along the military way near that border, they are going to encounter, I would suspect, um, these distant sculptures telling them that the next section of the road that they're walking along was constructed by the second or the sixth or the 20th legion. So a bit of competition going on there to show you uh, and to show them really 
what um, you know how much of the frontier each of these legions were building. And in fact, some of the distance sculptures uh, were found very closely together, uh, and they had the same uh, distance engraved upon them. But actually, I'm going to suggest that what that might suggest to us is that they were placed back to back in the same way that if we are crossing um, maybe the English and Scottish border just now, we will see, or even into a, a city, you know, you'll see you are just entering Scotland or you are just entering Glasgow or you are just leaving. <laughs> so you, depending on your direction of travel, you would know which section of the wall that you um, are walking on and the military way you're walking on uh, was constructed by which legion. So having gone over all of that background, I think we could potentially now return to the replica distance sculpture from Arne Bog in Cum Cumbernauld, North Lanarkshire, that we're really here to talk about today. So the Antonine Wall runs through five council areas um, and part of the Rediscovering the Antonine Wall project was to replicate distance sculptures from all of these areas. And the intention is to install all of them close to locations uh, where they were discovered along the wall. Now, this sculpture was in fact recovered from West, uh, Westerwood Fortlet, um, and that is number 19 on the map I showed you a moment ago here. This is a really beautifully or neatly decorated distance sculpture. Um, which was um, actually donated to the University of Glasgow along with other inscriptions in 1872 by John Buchanan, the owner of the sculpture. Now, regrettably, the exact provenance of the distance sculpture is quite uncertain because its precise place of discovery is not properly recorded. Um, what we do know is that it was discovered through ploughing by the family of a farmer close to Westerwood Fortlet um, and Arnibog Farm, hence the reason it's called um, Arnibog Sculpture. At this point, I would normally provide you with a translation of the familiar abbreviated Latin inscription that we talked about a moment ago um, for the Bridgeneck Sculpture. Uh, but I'm unable to do that today, uh, and that's because this particular sculpture does not contain an inscription, as you'll see here. Uh, instead, this is actually a fragment of the left side of a sculpted sandstone um, tablet, effectively, that bears only one feature, in fact, common to the other examples that, again, we saw earlier from Bridgenex and Somerset Farm. And that is this bound naked captive um, kneeling um, on the bottom of the fragment here. The decorative frames here are actually particularly that cabled frame in the centre um, differs quite markedly from the other examples on the Antonine wall as well, but it is actually reminiscent of some cables borders on sculptures from um, just south of Hadrian's Wall, for example, at Wind Vindalanda Port. We can see that cabled effect here, if you like, on uh, you know, features framing the inscriptions on an altar from Vindalanda. But another deeply enigmatic and unparalleled feature from the Antony Wall, in fact, is this figure of Triton on the top. As I say, it's not emulated on any other sculptures from the wall. Indeed, it's very rare um, to have uh, Romano-British sculptures um, with Triton on them, although there is an example on a funerary relief here of Croatia Denisia um, at Chester with two opposing um, Tritons blowing their seashells, you can see here on the top right. And this is probably alluding here to um, the deceased's voyage into the Isles of the Blessed in the afterlife. Um, Triton was a sea god uh, in both the Greek and Roman pantheons, and he was the son of Neptune um, for the Romans. So it's not surprising on, on Curatia's funerary sculpture, for example, that this contains a de depiction of him because it was found close to the River Dee, so a water-based location. But it's not clear why he is represented on a sculpture that's found on a landlocked location in central Scotland. So 
So in Roman mythology, Triton is depicted as human from the waist up, with feet resembling four feet of a horse uh, and a double forked merman-like tail. Now legend has it that he, um, it's when he sounded his horn he could calm the sea and still tempests, making them retreat into their rightful channels. Um, he's often depicted in a carriage drawn by bright blue horses, um, such as in this mosaic uh, from the houses of Ephesus uh, in Turkey, dating to the, either the 1st or 2nd century. Triton's thought here to be leading his bride or, or even an area had uh, seen him on a hippocamp. Um, but actually, um, on the right again, he's um, seen in sculpted relief on the altar of Domitius uh, at the Glyptotech Museum in Munich. So an enigmatic sculpture here that may or may not in fact be an example of a distance sculpture because we don't have an actual inscription to validate that statement. But on balance, I think it does seem fair to suggest that it could well be a fragment from one, albeit there are marked differences uh, between this monument and the other uh, examples from the Antony Wall. I think it's probably quite useful to take a look at the various stages in producing the sculpture. Um, so the Arne Bog replica was actually handcrafted by this incredibly talented group of advanced craft uh, apprentice stonemasons from the city of Glasgow College, who were an absolute pleasure, I must say, to work with on this project. And not only did it give these young people the opportunity to work on a very unique heritage based project, but they were able to develop and deploy skills that were very similar to their Roman stonemason uh, predecessors. So one of the first tasks that they undertook was to use high resolution scans of the original sculpture from the Hunterian Museum and that permitted them to create 3D prints and these were extremely useful tools really in permitting the students to accurately measure the carved features for size and depth um, without risking really any negative impact to the originals. So a very useful thing to have uh, using modern day technologies merged with uh, old techniques. And so the next stage of that process was actually to draw out the features to scale using those 3D prints so that they could then be accurately replaced onto uh, our replicas. Next, uh, the students roughed out the features and letters using really very specialist tools. And these were including a mail, which is a round hammer type tool, mail point chisels, tungsten tipped flat chisels, and a scutch, which is a teeth tool. And these tools are actually very relatively uh, unchanged uh, from their Roman counterparts, uh, although the mail would have been made from a hard wood and the chisels and scutch from iron sharpened metal. Hand tools were, although inevitably slower in the process than maybe a, a modern um, digitally um, laser cut finish. Um, what what that hand carving permitted the students to do was actually it permitted them to practice hand and eye coordination uh, to discover the forms in a much more organic and natural way. And that, I think, helped to produce um, the effect that was more aligned with the original um, distance sculptures. But also the, the attempts not to overwork the piece left some really relatively crude tool marks and that I would say proved quite challenging to these uh, young artisans because um, modern day aesthetics tend to require a much more precise and refined finish. So it kind of flies in the face um, <laughs> against their natural instincts of these artists to ask them not to refine their surfaces too much in order to retain and emulate the Roman character and techniques used uh, in the second century. And here is the finished product, and I think you'll agree it's absolutely spectacular and, and a real credit to all those skilled young people and their lecturers at Glasgow City College. And the final stage in the process for this sculpture, at this point anyway, 
um, is it being embedded into a new setting at Nethercroy, near Croyhill Fort along the wall uh, in North Lanarkshire. And really, this is a spectacular piece of art in its own right, and it's really a wonderful and accessible setting. Um, local communities are encouraged really to critically engage with their new sculpture and to create their own connections with it through stories that are yet to be told. Uh, some of these stories are very likely to deviate quite significantly from the narratives that are imposed, for example, through our traditional museum displays. Uh, and nearby, guarding over the sculpture is uh, another wonderful sculpture uh, as part of the project. Um, and it's uh, a sculpture named Sylvanus after the forest god. Um, and, and this is another outcome from the wonderful Rediscovering the Antonine Wall project. So together, some fantastic pieces of art here uh, for the local communities to enjoy. I mentioned a moment ago about um, these sculptures are not burdened by the restrictions that are necessarily in place in a museum setting. And, and by that, I mean things like lighting, restricted access times, no touching policies, guided content and interpretations, um, even internet access to engage with the, some necessary uh, and really interesting digital content. And things even like lighting over the course of a day will change um, and during the course of different seasons. All of this will change the way that these sculptures look and perform and how people experience them um, through the course of a year. Um, and in fact, over time, the patina, as in the surface of the stone, will also alter over time. And so people are encouraged to have a tactile and emotional and fully immersive experience and forge new relationships with their new sculpture. And I hope even in the future I might be able to meet some of you as you engage with the sculpture and hopefully some of the other replicas along the wall um, because I'm hoping to undertake some research going forward um, on their contemporary performance and how people in the current day receive them and engage with them. So next time you're wandering around your stately home or indeed any stately home, um, an old church or an old boundary wall somewhere in your area, I would encourage you to look very carefully and see if there isn't a Roman distance sculpture embedded into it. And if there is, obviously, you know, give me a call. I'd love to see it. Um, but another final thing I wanted to ask you to consider when you're contemplating these sculptures is how they might have looked had they been presented to you in full colour. Now this is some um, result of some of the work that I've been undertaking to identify the pigments that were once applied to the original Roman sculptures. And we can see this scene on the left. Uh, I think, I hope you'll agree that the colour applied to it is, gives us a much more sense of realistic, lifelike, authenticity on what is effectively a very brutal scene of battle um, you know to the extent that we can see all the different shades of red in the um, in the cabin woman's tunic for example and in, in his terges which is the leather um, over shirt if you like to go over his tunic his his cloak different shades there and also a very bright red on the end of his spear, which is depicting the blood coming from the, the northern barbarians that he has pierced. To the extent as well that we can use, you can see that bright red, lead red in fact, that was um, painted onto the decapitated head and neck of this fallen warrior. So again, just giving us a real different dimension to this uh, scene of battle um, and, and I think it would have had a very impactful um, kind of dynamism uh, to the iconography of this piece to an, an ancient audience and I'm sure to yourselves and as a contemporary audience as well. So I hope you feel encouraged to travel to Nethercroy and uh, experience the sculpture at first hand and you can do that by following the directions in this really helpful leaflet that's been produced by the Rediscovering the Antonine Wall project. Um, and that actually provides 
a, a, a map with a fine spot for the sculpture, as well as some really useful notes on how you can travel using different modes of transportation to get there. So again, thank you for joining me today. I, I welcome any comments or suggestions or um, questions that you might have.